Monica and our panel. Hi, so I'm Monica Doyle from Chaka Marketing. I'm a D, uh, digital media director. I have experience over six years in digital marketing and really the strategic development of our paid search accounts. So I'll let everyone um, kind of let me know a little bit more about yourselves. All right. Uh, I'm Kevin. I'm from Chewy, Chewy.com. Senior manager, um, basically on the team from social, search, uh, affiliate marketing, anything performance-based. Yep. Again, Mike Martinique, uh, Avis Budget Group, uh, manager of digital acquisition, search, social, display. I'm Casey Nielsen. I'm with Progression um, as a senior paid search strategist and been there for uh, coming up on four years now. Okay, great. So I think um, what we've been really hearing today is there's been a shift in search. Um, moving more towards audiences, a little bit away from keywords. And um, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is really that synergy between the different channels and really as um, more performance channels move in and out of paid search, how is that driving that final consumer and that conversion? So I'm going to be asking the panelists to tell me a little bit more about their best practices um, for that media plan uh, between the different um, the consumer journey. Because you know, as we all know, it's not linear anymore. And even in search, there's uh, different paths in that consumer journey. So let me know what does that really mean to you. Uh, yeah, I can take it, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, for us, really, what we try to do is just keep things as simple as possible. Um, we don't think of things really like in a silo, like we're doing search, we're doing social. What we try to do is focus on our customer first uh, and try to identify what different segments of that customer base we can then target. So what are the different performances that we're seeing across gender, uh, age, parental statuses that we can use within our audiences and then push out to social, push out to search, whether it be an in-market audience or an affinity audience uh, on the search side of things. So what we try to really focus on is just creating a, a, around five to seven different segments of our customer base, identifying, like I said, those demographics and also the reason that they're purchasing from, from us. Uh, for Chewy, our main competitor is Amazon, so there's a lot of uh, people purchasing from us and Amazon that are price specific, also ease because shipping is so easy uh, with Amazon going to one day shipping now. Um, and we also see uh, a lot of people looking for expert care. And that's kind of what we see as our differentiator from Amazon, that they can't provide that expert care that we do uh, at Chewy. And um, do you want to tell me a little bit more about how you're differentiating yourselves? I know you talked about the customer care, but maybe provide some examples of that. Yeah, so uh, an example of that, um, and really similar to anything you do uh, holistically as well, is that we have a uh, customer uh, care center that you can call. You get uh, someone picking up the phone within uh, three seconds and giving you uh, feedback on that purchase that you're trying to make. Um, or even customer service wide, uh, giving you uh, a refund or or something uh, to figure out the issue that you're having. So uh, we also do feedback across Twitter, Facebook, um, but also certain scenarios pop up is that we try to use this um, as a lever for driving up lifetime value um, as well. Uh, what we see a lot of times is you know, unfortunately, someone may have a death of a pet, um, and even though it's kind of not great to say, that's like an opportunity for us to build uh, a new customer for life. So what we do in those situations is we'll give them a full refund on what they just purchased, tell them to donate that food to a shelter, and really try to build some trust between that customer during that hard point in their life. And Mike and Casey, if you kind of want to go a little bit more into understanding the different audience segments. Yeah, so uh, from an audience segmentation standpoint, um, you know, it's a bit different across Avis and Budget, which gives us some kind of unique opportunities to, you know, uh, speak to our audiences a little bit differently. But, uh, you know, 
the basic idea is, you know, we want to go after in-market leisure renters. That's the primary focus uh, across both brands. Um, but within that, there are certain, you know, high profitability uh, segments and audiences that we try to go after, you know, such as uh, people who are looking for a longer re length of rental. Um, you know, we want to make sure that, um, you know, we're spending our money where it's worth it to spend our money, you know. Um, you know, things like um, p people who are, um, you know, more likely to purchase ancillaries, people who are, you know, traveling with uh, larger uh, family units, things like that. Uh, that's kind of where our head is at and how we kind of um, slice things up and target people differently. And do you see a similarity between the different audiences, between different channels? So I know you mentioned that it's um, the consistency of messaging. That's what you're seeing with the audiences as well. Yeah, so, you know, um, across different channels, it's, um, we kind of talk to people uh, and go after people a little bit heavier, uh, depending on the channel. You know, it seems that, you know, from our learnings, it seems that, you know, it's, we're able to control the lever for driving longer uh, lengths of rental, for, to use that example again, um, particularly in um, programmatic, uh, for retargeting in particular. Um, whereas in, in search, we, um, we don't see as big of a lift when we actively go after those users. And Casey? Yeah, just to kind of add to that. So progression um, is in the credit repair industry. Uh, we currently have three brands. It's Lexington Law, creditrepair.com, and credit.com. And so with our audiences, um, a lot of it has to do with those that are looking to either buy a home or look for a loan, um, renting a house, things like that. And so with our audience targeting, we have to make sure that our, our messaging is aligned with what they're looking for and kind of convince them that they need credit repair. And so we currently have um, call centers as part of our uh, company that people call in and talk to an agent about their credit repair. And so we have to make sure that we align ourselves with what our agents are telling them and what is in our ads. And so a lot of that takes collaboration uh, with our messaging and connecting with our audiences and making sure that we're aligned uh, there and making sure that, that someone that sees our ad isn't talking to an agent about something different. So keeping it, it consistent uh, is a huge push that our, our company is uh, working on. So. Yeah, and with call centers, I think that's um, something that everyone can really relate to. It's having that consistent messaging because um, it's not just between the different channels that you have a little more control over. You have to really work with the agents and probably even monitor and listen to some of the calls to make sure that it's aligned. Uh, was this a struggle that you really had to overcome? It definitely was. Um, so one thing, like you mentioned, we, have, we listen to calls on a weekly basis. So we have tons of calls that come in and that's part of our job actually is listening to calls and making sure that our messaging is aligning with what uh, people are searching for. So an example that we kind of came across um, is people who are looking for credit repair are wanting to talk to the credit bureaus. And so our messaging on our ads would say credit bureaus in the ad and people would be calling in to our agents thinking that they were actually talking to the credit bureaus. And so our agents would be confused, the caller would be confused and it was just kind of a mess. And so we had to make sure to include in our ads that you're disputing an inaccurate item on your credit to the credit bureaus. And so thankfully the, the uh, character length in our ads has increased so we can explain that a little more and make sure um, that people know that they're not actually talking to the credit bureaus, they're working with the company to repair their credit and get an item off their uh, credit report. Okay, and um Mike, you even mentioned during your presentation with RSAs and really finding what, um, what combination of different headlines, description lines really works. Have you used that to then um, focus on having those new expanded text ads and using those different combinations or in general, how, all of, how are all of you using automation? Because I think it's, um, you know, whenever it's tested, it can kind of go both ways. And, you know, a lot of the time with automation, we don't see the success that we expect and we really have to play around with it to make it work. So if you all can kind of explain what you've seen from that. Yeah, so, um, you know, with the responsive search ads, um, kind of drawing conclusions from the data that you get back from that is a little challenging because um, the report that you get back from Google is, uh, I, I believe, just impression-based. So you have to kind of, 
you have to kind of take a bit of a leap, but it's something. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, what we do is, you know, we kind of use that as a, um, a farm system almost to, to, you know, take those top performers. We'll pull out one or two, replace those in our existing kind of group of, of, um, of um, RSA permutations, and then we keep testing and pulling things out and testing and pulling things out. And um, that's kind of the, the cycle that, that we perform right now. And across channels, um, you know, we'll then start to do the same thing with, um, you know, our, our display and social ads. You know, we'll, we'll use, you know, Facebook dynamic ads to test um, a, a few of the winners that we've seen and see which ones resonate. And it's not always the same. That's, that's what's kind of interesting about it. You know, uh, the way you talk to people in the different channels obviously uh, has to be different, but um, it can provide some good learnings if you keep good track of it. And Kevin? Yeah, um, I would say for RSA and really testing anything specifically, we try to pick out really just a primary metric we're testing against. Um, so for RSAs, uh, even though kind of you'd think at face value it'd be CTR, but uh, I think there was like a, a great article uh, maybe a month ago where RSAs were kind of increasing your overall reach uh, because you were showing for lower quality score uh, searches. So with our RSAs, that's kind of what we're looking for. We're, we're looking for that uh, additional expansion that's possible through RSAs. Um, and then similar to what Mike is saying, kind of using those top performers and bringing them into ETAs as well. Casey, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, just basically the uh, same answer, I guess, for me as far as uh, a lot of it's uh, making sure we have a good variety in those uh, responsive search ads and uh, testing those. And hopefully, uh, I think Google will, is going to be coming out with more uh, maybe metrics around that instead of just kind of an impression base so it can actually give us more uh, performance metrics on those RSA ads. But um, just making sure there's a good variety in there and um, making sure to mix, mix it up and, and find what works uh, for our company. So. Yeah, I think we kind of struggle with trying to get more information out of Google and them wanting to make sure um, kind of not providing as much data and really trying to trust that algorithm, which I think naturally as, um, you know, in search, that's something that um, is just hard for us. But um, Kevin, what's, you know, really interesting, you mentioned that you have the different customer base and different focus on the different stages of the funnel between the different channels. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, yeah, um, so I can't get into like specifics of audiences that we have personally, but uh, just for kind of an example, I did come up with one how it could lead into your kind of holistic strategy across channels. Um, so say you see kind of like a younger demographic trending female, um, that's a 18 to like 25, uh, that has like a higher propensity uh, for gaming. Uh, this is all kind of readily available uh, in Google Analytics. Um, so from there, our strategy would be to, uh, to like I said earlier, look at in-market audiences, affinity for search, look at social on Facebook, Instagram side. Are there any specific interest groups that we could target that are relevant to that specific uh, customer? Is it, and then is there anything kind of out of the box affiliate wise um, that we could do um, as well? Um, so we really use those three levers to kind of uh, push traffic to the site and then uh, use those audiences once they've landed on site to then uh, remarket to them as well. Uh, so remarket through which channels? Do you use social for that as well? Yeah, uh, really across the board. Uh, social uh, display um, are our two main levers that we use uh, for remarketing. And, and Casey, what um, different channels do you use? You mentioned with the call centers, but how are you using some of the other channels, um, even when we're looking at the different DMAs and the lift that you've seen overall in search? Yeah, so we use a variety of channels, and this has been a big push for us too, uh, is working uh, with our other uh, departments within marketing to try and uh, help with our brand impressions. Because um, that's been a, a one thing that we have been working on a lot is trying to get our brand impressions up because you can't just have uh, an executive come to you and tell you to uh, increase brand impressions, right? It just doesn't work that way. And so we need to get creative that way. And one, one thing that we have done um, with our testing is work closely with our offline uh, team, so TV and radio. 
and uh, more specifically with DMAs, it was a uh, uh, kind of just a small test that we ran. We we put uh, uh, DMAs in our brand campaigns to track impressions, and so we had two separate groups. We had a control group and a, and a test group to measure uh, impressions in the specific DMAs that we were running uh, TV and radio in. And we ran that for a couple months and measured it, it weekly, and we actually saw great results. We saw anywhere between 10 to 25% increase in impressions within those DMAs, and it was just a small test um, with a few DMAs, but it was, it was a good indicator that we should start looking to spend a little more in TV and radio to help us increase with our, our brand impressions. So. And really, how do you all differentiate yourself from your competitors? Um, Kevin, I know you mentioned with Amazon, that's you know, definitely a big one, but even uh, you know, PetSmart and Petco, they have some great apps as well. Uh, do you utilize your app? Yeah. Um on the mobile app side, uh, it would go into the remarketing uh, budget as well, uh, just trying to push lifetime value through the app um, because we do offer auto ship and that's kind of um, a win for us getting a new customer uh, onto auto ship. That's where we see the high uh, lifetime value that we're looking for. Uh, but in terms of like differentiation, uh, it really is kind of pushing expert care um, and ease to finding uh, what you want. Uh, expert care is a differentiator with Amazon. Uh, it's a little bit different on the Petco side of things, but we still think we can uh, offer a better experience uh, for kind of a new pet owner who needs to do a bit of research uh, before uh, purchasing as well. And, and, you know, speaking of that, I know that there's also been um, a little bit of a change with the uh, you know, pet industry where people are focusing a little bit more on the health of their pets um, and actually looking for those natural dog foods, um, not, you know, some of those that have a lot of fillers. Have you seen that shift and how have you been able to really combat that? Uh, yeah, we've definitely seen that shift uh, probably in the last six to 12 months. Um, with that shift, we've kind of used uh, user demand to influence uh, what we want to do um, in terms of our product offerings as well. So I think search is kind of a great tool to utilize to say, you know, this is trending within our search query report. You know, no one has this available product right now or no one's thinking of a product like this, but clearly the consumer wants it and that influences what we do uh, on the product side of things if we're doing private label. Great, and um, what about Mike? How do you differentiate yourselves from your competitors? Yeah, so <clears throat> this can be a bit challenging, you know, in the car rental industry, um, you know, it, most of the differentiation comes with just kind of brand image, I would think, um, you know, our, our fleets aren't terribly different, um, you know, the service levels, you can talk about the service levels, but at the end of the day, you know, sometimes when it comes to car rental, uh, there's a certain perception there. So where we try to uh, stand out, I think, the most is in the kind of specific um, offers that we can put out there for specific locations that we're trying to, um, you know, uh, uh, increase our business in. Uh, we're able to do that a bit. Um, you know, there are some kind of uh, more unique uh, partnership offers that, that we're able to put out there. Um, for example, our, um, our Amazon offer that we currently have. Um, those types of things kind of uh, are the little edges that you need to kind of get in there to, um, to stand out from the pack. Um, you know, uh, along with Kevin's point, you know, we, um, you know, we, we just recently uh, launched a, a more robust uh, app for budget. Uh, Avis's app has been out there for a while, and, uh, you know, both of the, the experiences on, on those are, we feel are, are very strong, especially, um, you know, uh, compared to some other, um, you know, uh, app solutions out there in the industry, and, and so uh, we're, we're pretty proud of that, and uh, those are some of the, yeah. And I would imagine with that, it's a little bit tougher to be able to really track um, how do you overcome that? Um, are you talking about within the, the app? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's, you know, don't know how much I can go into on that, but it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, and we, we're trying to get by there. <laughs> yeah. Right. And um, I guess, Casey, if you want to go a little bit more into competitors and how you're be able to differentiate um, progression. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, one thing that our company positions ourselves in is being uh, a leader in credit repair, and so 
Uh, we offer a few different products uh, or tiers within that credit repair um, products, and we consider it a, a premium uh, credit repair uh, compared to others where um, you aren't getting the help that you need. So that's where our call centers come in and uh, want to actually talk with, with a human about their credit repair and discuss their credit report and understand it. And so a lot of people are actually calling instead of signing up and online. And so are actually our sales for our 70% uh, on the phone compared to uh, online signups. So uh, people actually want to call in. We're actually doing a test right now uh, on the weekends where we actually we take away the phone number to see if that has any impact on the weekends and if people will actually sign up online and that, if that will help with our servicing costs. Um, and we left, a, we left a, a teeny phone number at the bottom of the website that people are actually finding. And it was surprising. We thought there was going to be a big decrease um, in sales over the weekend, but it was just a slight uh, decrease because people actually want to call in and talk to someone and have them consult uh, them about what uh, what they should do going forward with their credit report. Uh, so with that, um, that's, you know, obviously been a small test. Is, is all of your focus really just continuing to test and try, um, you know, different things, whether that's with the different audiences or different channels, um, just in general, different focuses? Um, do you have any examples that you guys can share with that? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, like I said, you know, we, we, we test a number of different, um, you know, high profitability uh, factors uh, across all channels, um, you know, but one thing that we really try to um, test pretty uh, avidly across everything is, uh, you know, making sure that our incrementality is on point. That's something that's really important to us. Um, so uh, without getting into the strategy too much, that's, um, you know, uh, th that's been a big emphasis just to make sure that we're not, uh, going after people who would already book, you know, uh, based on the fact that, you know, uh, between Avis and Budget, um, there's a lot of um, uh, brand recognition there. There's, you know, uh, we're likely to um, have customers come to us um, kind of regardless. So we're trying to um, do things to measure um, how much our paid media is actually uh, impacting um, incremental uh, new users and things like that. So in GA, there's a lot of uh, different audiences, a lot of capabilities where you can pull in audiences that um, new users versus sessions, um, the pages they visited, and kind of like their journey through the site. Is that something that you're using? Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're always taking a look at that. Um, you know, it's something that you especially need to keep an eye on, you know, when you're getting all this information from all these different sources, you know, one analytics platform might be saying this, uh, you know, your, um, you know, some of your partners might be saying this, uh, but we kind of definitely use that as a fact checker and source of truth to keep an eye on it and make sure that that is indeed what we're uh, observing from our results. And Kevin, do you utilize GA? Yeah, I would say very similar to Mike. We're always testing um, basically any lever you can pull in Google, Bing, any audience uh, that you can import in, uh, then across any other channel. We're certainly always testing, yeah. And Casey? Yeah, same. Yep, we have a, we also have a kind of MarTech team that we work with closely that uh, helps us uh, with those analysis and, and audiences as far as pulling those in and, and testing those. So. Great. Um, I guess another question that I have is more along the lines of, um, you know, as, a, as search really plays into along with the other channels and you want that synergy between them and, you know, the, um, the, the audiences, the messaging, all of that. And attribution is always, uh, you know, it's, there's no way that we can really see true attribution. We have to have a little bit more trust. It's like that gut trust, knowing that what's working and continuous testing, as we kind of mentioned. Do you have any other remarks that, um, you know, on that topic that has helped you or any challenges that you're currently experiencing with that? Yeah, I would just say uh, in terms of attribution, I would just align it uh, to your business model. Um, and that's probably like the best route to go. Uh, at least that's what we do. Yeah, uh, definitely. Cross-channel attribution is is 
a big challenge. Um, you know, I'm sure that's the same for a lot of people. Um, you know, it, it's tough when you're looking at search versus uh, display, and you know, there are um, you know multi-touch attribution systems that that we look at. We're continuing to look at, um, just trying to make sure that we're finding the right fit that's going to actually you know properly assign credit across the board. Um, and it's it's very important because you know when you're trying to uh, make a case internally at your company, um, maybe to people who don't uh, understand the space quite as well, they, they don't kind of live and breathe it, um, it's important to kind of say, you know, we're putting this much in, we're getting that much out, and, you know, if you're trying to, you know, uh, make a case for staying active in display, it's kind of a long-winded explanation, uh, you know, if you're looking at last click. So, yeah, it's a challenge. It's an it's a ongoing challenge for us, for sure. Yeah, same, I mean, spot on with, with what Michael was saying. It, it's, it's a challenge, I think, with uh, trying to get people to understand um, the importance of attribution, right, and, and trying to prove your case uh, you know, with the example of offline or TV and radio, prove our case that that is important for our brand impressions. They're not just going to grow, you know, out of nowhere, and so we need to do something about it, and that's where testing comes in, and attribution and it makes it difficult when you're just looking at a last touch uh, model and so uh, attribution is definitely uh, uh, I think a push for for a lot of people right now and uh, something very important that we should be looking at. And, and with that um, there's been uh, you know with some of the privacy concerns and we don't really have the ability to track as much um, and I think a lot of the budget um, reallocation or just allocation in general really depends on what drives that final conversion and you know that's uh, part of the discussion today is that it's really hard to find that touch point um, to really understand how it drives towards that final conversion. Do you find challenges? I'm assuming you're all working with the different departments. Um, so. How does that work with working closely, aligning in that messaging and um, really allocating your budgets? I know you cannot really go into too much detail with that, but just kind of give like a broad overall on um, how you really overcome that. Uh, yeah, I would say we kind of look at the benefits of each channel. Um, so previous to what Mike was saying uh, in his presentation, if you know social is going to drive potential brand awareness along with uh, purchases or a lead, um, then you probably want a higher, uh, say, CPA goal uh, for that channel compared to another one that's lower funnel. So um, that's how we, how I think we should try to break things out. Um, and yeah, just have an understanding and kind of a trust behind it as well. Yeah, uh, for us, thankfully, as far as acquisition goes, it's not that much of a challenge getting alignment from the different, um, you know, acquisition channels because, uh, you know, myself and my team uh, oversee all of them, so that's, that's a good thing. Uh, we're able to kind of, uh, you know, add and subtract wherever uh, we see fit when we uh, think that we're seeing certain trends, we're able to, um, again, to throw out there the te test and learn kind of mentality month over month to kind of see when we move budgets around what's shifting. And so we have a good amount of freedom with that. Yeah, and with, with us, I think uh, the allocation of budget, um, it's, I think it's kind of always changing and testing um, just to make sure it's kind of a steady process that we need to be patient with as we bring in attribution and multi-touch uh, um, and how we kind of measure that budget. And so we need to figure out what works and what doesn't and uh, work with, with how we allocate the budget that way. I, and I'm interested, do you use any video? I know that, you know, we've been talking about some of the other channels, but I feel like Google has really been pushing video. It's been growing and there's a lot of data behind um, you know, how in general the, like, YouTube, you know, and it's not just about YouTube, but with how TV is just now, you know, starting to use, um, it, like, the smart TVs. And I'm sure you've seen even on search that when looking at device, um, you're starting to see TV in there. Is, is that something that you guys are really starting to utilize, maybe something that you've always have been? Uh, yeah, I think it goes back to, like, consistent messaging. So... Uh, like ideally you would want TV to match up to what you're doing on the video side with say YouTube um, and then pulling kind of 
similar uh, audience and other uh, levers within YouTube that you can pull on the Google side. So utilizing kind of both data sets to influence what you're doing on the video side. Yeah, um, definitely interested in that. I, and I, you know, like you said, Google has a big push for, for trying to, you know, every, every time we talk to our, our contacts, you know, they, they have suggestions and, and I, I think they're very valid and very good suggestions. Um, I just, um, you know, for us, I think we don't we don't do too much with video right now. I think there's an opportunity there, but it's um, you know we we I think where we get hung up is you know from an acquisition standpoint in video, knowing what to say, mm -hmm. um, you know uh, as as car rental brands, um, you know uh, that's where we're going to be focusing. I think um, and and once we get that in play, uh, we're absolutely going to be testing uh, going a little bit more into video for sure. Yeah, because even uh, the reason I really mentioned it is um, with the brand lift studies. Now we have a little bit more view on how video is able to really influence um, search. So, um, Casey, have you tested any of that yet? Yeah, yeah. So my team uh, has done some of that as far as uh, uh, testing and getting those brand lift surveys uh, in return. And there's been some positive results uh, so far that we've seen. And so it's been a push just in the past few months for us and something we're currently testing, but uh, making sure that our messaging is, is aligned with what we're saying on TV so people aren't uh, seeing our commercials or seeing our YouTube videos and coming to Google and not sure which company they, they saw and making sure that, that it's aligned that way. So it's been a good, uh, good test for us so far and it seems to be working well. So. Great. Um, I, do you guys have any other closing remarks or anything else you wanted to touch on? I think we're good. Yeah, it covers it for me. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have time for questions. We have one back here. Uh, Pichokti Connectivity, I had one quick comment and then maybe a question, a follow up. Um, one was, uh, the comment around the customer service. I know you kind of skipped over that a little bit as a differentiator, but I'm a parent of three children and I travel and you know how much I hate car seats and trying to get those stupid car seats in and out and adjusting those belts. I had an experience as a uh, driving and traveling a couple times with uh, a car rental place and they would make sure they came with their bag, nice and clean, freshly vacuumed, steam cleaned, and would make sure they adjusted those belts for me, had it all set in, and um, that's the, you know, I'm loyal to that. That company's strictly because of that. So, you know, I would be careful and sensitive to, um, you know, skip over that a little bit. But my question specifically was more around the prospect of social to the display times two to kind of picking that up. I liked your image on the harvesting and kind of search picking that up, Michael. And I was wondering, what is the timeline from that prospect and that search first touch to search picking that up and what have you seen? I mean, is that 180 days, 90 days, 120, 30 days? How fast is that? Because we've seen similar and I'm just trying to see by industry, you know, what is that time um, that the customer journey completes? So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the customer service angle, your point is well taken there. Um, that, that is something that we, I kind of glossed over it, uh, but absolutely, that totally understand that's something that people really care about uh, when it comes to car rental, because there can be some, you know, there can be some great experiences, there can be some nightmare experiences, um, as I'm sure you all know, anybody who's rented a car can attest to that. Um, yeah, so in terms of the, the diagram that I put up there, you know, we typically see, um, with acquisition uh, for car rental, our path to conversion is uh, a bit shorter than some other in the travel industry. It's a little bit more, you know, uh, certainly not 180 days. It, it typically is, um, you know, one of those very, of the travel process, it's probably, you know, closer to like five, eight days, something like that. Um, I'd have to double check on the, the, based on the numbers that I put up there, I kind of just grabbed, um, you know, what was showing up in there, but, um, yeah, it's typically closer to that span of time. I think Pete just gave you your video strategy. 
Uh, by the way, <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think yeah. you know, telling telling stories of what parents have to go through with rental cars and who services them yeah. best is there. There's your video strategy. Right I will there. bring that to the brand team. Thank you very but much. <laughs> I wanted to pick up on video um, and and particularly come back to Kevin on that, since Chewy, it would seem to me, would have a real educational component. Uh, and I'm, so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about the overall video strategy, how you're using that channel, and 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 how it plays into uh, brand growth. Yeah, I would say right now, kind of altering our video strategy to add that component of education and really push um, that we're the experts. So I'd say currently, if you sh if you saw one of our commercials, it's more uh, kind of uh, pricing and shipping uh, based. So we're trying to add that ed education component to really go after those new pet owners um, and provide that trust. Um, and the way we're executing that uh, is between YouTube uh, and TV and trying to allow that to drive brand awareness for us to fuel search, uh, like a lot of people have been saying, to fuel that branded search as well. Mike, I wanted to follow up on uh, your, your point about social and how it's sort of evolved your messaging. I'm curious, has it also evolved and changed your targeting in social? Are you going after two different people, uh, different segments, different locations, knowing that it has this kind of impact on, on search? Uh, try to be careful with how I answer. I don't want to go into too much detail, but um, short answer is yes. You know, to, to the extent that we can, we try to, um, you know, uh, run our search program similar to the successes that we see, I'm sorry, our social program similar to the successes that we see in search. So we kind of try to chase that. Um, uh, so yes, I, I think there's plenty more that we can and, and will be doing to uh, get more granular with how we go about that. Um, but as of right now, we're, we're kind of kind of just doing what we can. We're, we're you know, like I said, we've we we just kind of drastically increased our budgets to the point where it's um, what I would say a viable channel for us. Um, and so uh, there's going to be a lot more uh, experimentation that that comes from that down the line. How about channel choice uh, between, say, Facebook? You, you, you use the Facebook and, and Instagram icons. How do each of those perform differently for you? Um, so, you know, based on the kind of auto optimizations that occur, we, we tend to see much more towards, you know, mobile Facebook. Um, that, that's where it seems to all be going right now. Um, like I said, when it comes down to us actually, um, you know, getting a bit more hands on as we're kind of gathering in preliminary results um, after this, uh, this shift in strategy. Um, that could change, but as of right now, primarily Facebook. I have one last global question for all three of you, and it is how, because we're going to talk about this more tomorrow in greater depth, but since we're, since we're talking about changing in the, in the mix and the ways in which search is being integrated with other performance media, I'm curious about how it's impacted your tech strategy. Have you changed at all what you're bringing in-house as opposed to what you're outsourcing uh, and, and any changes to the technology in order to accommodate this? Let's start with the in-house in and outsourcing question. Yeah, uh, we try, uh, at least for the most part, to keep mostly everything uh, in-house just because we understand our customer uh, better uh, than a potential uh, vendor uh, at the moment. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the in-house uh, question right there. So pretty much across all the channels you're doing. Yeah, well. okay. yep. yeah kind, of, kind of the same deal for us. Um, you know, there, there are certain vendors that um, we either work with now or we're, we're just starting to work with um, in, in the realm of, of, of your question that, um, you know, kind of provide um, a bit of a, uh, you know, they're technically not in-house and they, they work with us um, pretty um, pretty closely, but we're able to really um, go into their platform and, and control it ourselves. So in a sense, it's a bit of a hybrid between being um, in-house and, and outsourced. Yeah, same. We, we have uh, a lot of it is in-house, and we have a, a little bit of a hybrid uh, as far as offline and radio, having uh, agencies that we work with. Um, the one thing the past year that we've built uh, up pr very strong is our MarTech team. Um, to help us with a lot of our in-house strategy and our website optimization, uh, conversion rates, and testing our, our landing pages um, that way and, and directing our messaging to those pages and, and doing a lot of testing with, our, with that team. And since we raised attribution models, are all of you looking towards off-the-shelf solutions or are you try, gonna try to build this in-house? Attribution model. Um, yeah, so in-house for, for us currently we're working on that attribution. Yeah, uh, we, we've, we've 
taken a stab at, at doing it in-house. Um, that's still something that's a, a bit shelved for the time being, so we started looking around a, a little bit to, to outsource it. Um, and that has, has since been a little bit shelved for the time being. So we're kind of, um, we're open to all options, but it's looking like it's probably going to be an off-the-shelf type of thing for us. Yeah, we're weighing uh, kind of both options right now um, to see which is the best solution for us. We're going to uh, have a roundtable at the end of the morning uh, extending this topic. Monica, guys, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are going to.